pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Graham Joseph Hill. Dr. Hill is research coordinator at Sterling Theological College in Melbourne, Australia, and also the author of the text that we'll be discussing today, Global Church, Reshaping Our Conversations, Renewing Our Mission, Revitalizing Our Churches. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, for joining us today. Lovely to be with you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Hill, you have been a passionate uh, student of the global church for some years now. That's the way most of us know you. And you've been doing this for some time, even as a student in India in your 20s. When did you first turn your attention to the formal study of global Christianity? There were probably two moments that were formative uh, for me in convincing me that this was an area that I should be focusing my energies on. The first moment was about 15 years ago, I was speaking at a seminar in Manila and uh, there were thousands of attendees from all across Asia. And I said to my wife, you know, to save money, can I stay at a backpackers hostel? She said, sure, if that's what you want to do. So I was staying at a backpackers hostel and I was woken up to the sound of weeping and sobbing one morning, about five in the morning. And I I looked down and the bunk below me was an elderly Asian man. I got to know him over the course of the week and discovered that he was a Vietnamese pastor who 30 years ago had planted a, a small home church, uh, which over the course of 30 years had grown to about 40 or 50,000 people meeting in homes across Vietnam. And as I listened to his stories, what it sounded to me like the story of the early church. Uh, stories of suffering and persecution. He was one of four brothers and they'd all planted churches, but three of them had been taken away by the authorities and never seen again. But also extraordinary growth under great suffering. But what really disturbed me was that when I was speaking at the uh, seminar, at the conference, all of the speakers looked like me. You know, white, male, middle-aged, university educated, whereas the vast majority of the audience were actually didn't look like us at all. Uh, majority female and majority Asian. And I remember going home saying to my wife, something doesn't feel right about this. And I, my story is insignificant compared to the story of this Vietnamese pastor who I'd come across. And yet his story was not being told. And I said to her, I think that it's time for us to commit to, to amplifying and honouring the voices of the majority world church and not just continuing to listen to the same voices. So that was a, one of, that was a first memorable moment for me. The second was I, I published this book, um, Salt, Light and City, which is a, a missional ecclesiology, uh, putting missional theology as it's developing in the West in conversation with 12 scholars from four different traditions, Catholic, Orthodox, mainline Protestant, and uh, Free Church Congregational. And the book has, has got a lot of traction, which has been good, but one of the, the criticisms that came back from reviewers was that the vast majority of the authors, uh, theologians that I'm engaging with, are Western theologians. And what's to say that they're the most insightful theologians about the mission of the church today? And that was a moment for me as well, where I, in order to head off criticisms of my book, in the final chapter, I said, I'm going to commit myself to producing a series of books that look at majority world theology. You know, and I'm one of these guys that once I commit myself to something like that, then I'm stuck and I have to do it. <laughs> so over the last um, five or six years, I've committed myself. The second volume, which will come out, looks at 25 majority world theologians and what they say about the mission of the church and of course as you've alluded to I also produced this book on global theology. How oh, wonderful. Dr. Hill, uh, you produced, I think it was in 2015, you produced 140 video interviews with leaders of the global church which is really a, a staggering uh, accomplishment, especially as I understand that almost all the film work or perhaps all the film work was done in person, in studio with these leaders. Um, you also produce today an ongoing podcast on global Christianity. Would you be willing to share with us, how is it that you chronicle some of the principal insights that you're learning from this enormous amount of data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
the origin of that particular enterprise, and I've done about 350 interviews now, uh, about 140 of them, as you say, have been published. The origin of that is that I was uh, invited by my publisher to write a follow-up book to, to, to this one, The Global Church. Um, and I went home and I talked to my family about it. And um, my family said to me, you know what? You academics love your big, thick, expensive books that very few people read. But maybe it's time for you to actually get involved in the new media. Uh, why don't you start to get involved in filming and podcasting? And now I'm an introvert. I love the libraries and I love writing. I'm very nervous about traveling and speaking to people. But I began to feel like this really was what God was calling me to do. So I went and did a short, short course on filming. I spent a lot of money buying gear that I could travel with. Uh, and for six months, I traveled through Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, indigenous and first nation contexts across Oceania, interviewing Christian leaders. The, the goal is to actually listen to Christian leaders from the majority world, tell their own stories. Um, the world doesn't need me to tell their stories. Um, I think listening to them tell their own stories is more important. Chronicling that data has been a challenge. At this point, I've mostly produced the films, uh, short versions and longer versions and podcasts. I've started reducing the, the one hour interviews down into 60 second snippets that um, the churches and seminaries can use just to stimulate discussion as well. Um, and I've just been thinking that I might actually get all of these interviews, because there's a rich data source here. I might get all of these interviews transcribed, begin to enter them into something like En Vivo, and begin doing data analysis on what actually emerges from this, this rich source of, of information. So in other words, when all of these 350 interviews are transcribed, what do we learn that Majority World Voices are saying about creation care, justice, discipleship, mission, and using a program like Envivo, uh, QSR Envivo, which can analyze all of this, this data, actually producing some, some, I hope, some quality research out of this material. Mm. Dr. Hill, as you conducted this research and continue to with your podcast, uh, what have been some of the greatest surprises that you've encountered as you've been speaking with these majority world leaders? I think that what has been most enriching for me and surprising has been those interviews with people who are not high profile. So what my practice was is that I would turn up into a city where I'd be interviewing a high profile theologian or author and normally I knew what that author was going to say. I'd read all of their books. I designed the questions. I was pretty sure I knew what they were going to say. So there were no great surprises for me. But at the end of the interview, I'd say to them, can you tell me two or three outstanding Christian leaders in your city whose names are not known and who probably never published anything that I could contact today and just duck across uh, over the next couple of days and do filmed interviews with them. And actually the most rich and I think most exciting and surprising interviews were with those kinds of leaders. Uh, people who you didn't know what they were going to say, who were doing some really exciting things on the ground and who were going to say things that were quite surprising to me. Um, and the thing is when you interview, interview high profile theologians, they don't always represent the voice of the, the, the church in their city, of course. They, um, it's often people on the ground who give you a better insight into actually what's happening in the church in a particular city. So that was interesting. The things that have surprised me are things like the way in which the church in the West tends to polarize and dichotomize. So we tend to separate rather than integrate. We tend to think word, spirit, a justice, proclamation, uh, creation care, politics. We tend to kind of polarise and maybe um, put things into uh, quarantine things or isolate things. But when you're in the majority world, none of that makes sense. So I'll give you an example. I um, was talking to a Christian leader in Thailand and I said to him, how do you discern when it's time to, to not only proclaim the word, but also get involved in politics and justice? And he said to me, 
why would you ever think that the two things can be separated? I don't really understand why you'd even ask that question. And it reminded me that my whole way of thinking is in these kind of silos. Another example is I was interviewing a pastor in Rwanda and he had planted, he was in his early 30s, he, he planted something like 40 churches. And I said to him, how do you know when a past, someone who's called to be a pastor and a shepherd or a pastor? And he said, I don't get the question. And I said, well, you know, some people are kind of, they have a shepherding gift or maybe a teaching gift, but others are much more entrepreneurial and pioneering and innovative and planting. So how do you discern the difference? And he looked at me puzzled and he said, what a strange question. He said, what kind of pastor doesn't plant churches? And I don't think the answer is that every pastor in the West needs to become a church planter. But what he was saying to me was that the kind of questions I was asking had been completely framed by my own context, which is normal, of course. And so one of the ways to answer your question is what surprised me constantly was how narrow or um, sharply defined my whole way of seeing theology in the church was by my own context and my need to listen and pay attention to other ways of seeing theology in the church. Dr. Hill, in one of the opening chapters of your text, the title of the chapter is Glocalizing Conversations. You stress that theological conversations should be both global in scope, but also locally engaged. Uh, with the rise of international travel and instantaneous global telecommunication, what is lost when our churches identify with global conversations but fail to maintain local presence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my experience, most local churches tend to be more focused on the local than the global. And the challenge often is, is helping them to, to pay attention to global voices. Um, and also see the relevance of those voices. So when I go around, I talk to lots of local churches about world Christianity. Normally the question is, well, so what? Well, what does this mean for my local context? So that's often the challenge. But as you suggest, many people in our church today are very mobile. You know, I go to a church that's about a thousand people and it's an upper middle class church. And I'll, I'll talk to someone on a Sunday and I'll discover that last week they were in Singapore, you know, this week they were in Bangkok, a lot of travel all around the world. So people are very mobile. Getting them to listen to global voices, but also get deeply involved in their local context is a real challenge. I've taken up the role as writer theologian in residence at my local church so that I can be deeply embedded in a local church that is seeking to do mission in its local context. Something like 70% of everyone in my suburb has an Asian ethnic background, about 30% Caucasian, 70% Asian. About 35% of all the people who live in my suburb are first generation immigrants to Australia. So we're a very diverse, very multicultural, an exciting area to do mission in. My particular street, there's probably about five different religious groups in my street alone. And I'm constantly trying to, as a writer theologian in residence at my local church, I'm constantly trying to help my local church pay attention to what is God doing globally? What have we learned about spirit, about discipleship and about mission from global voices? But then what does this mean for us in our suburb where 30 something percent of people are first, first generation immigrants, where there are multiple religions represented in our own streets. How do we deeply connect in the local, in our neighborhood? I'm constantly asking this question. And I, I think one of our cha great challenges is helping local churches, as you suggest, pay attention to global voices, but always think about, well, what does this mean for my street, for my suburb, for my neighborhood? Um, and always putting those things into practice in the local context. Dr. Hill, there are many schemata to attempt to explain the differences between Western and Eastern theology. Um, what is your preferred paradigm? This is a really good question. Um, I haven't settled on a particular paradigm. I've enjoyed the work by Timothy Tennant um, and his examination of 
theology as it's developing in the, in the majority world in the global south. You know, he suggests, for instance, that it's important for us to remember that majority world Christians, um, by and large, are more conservative, uh, traditionalist, or orthodox, if you want to use that word. They accept the, th the authority of scripture in a much more literal way, and by Western standards, um, are much more confident in the gospel and in scripture. Um, he suggests as well that majority world Christians are likely to be much more morally and ethically conservative. Um, the majority world Christians are much more interested in poverty and justice and in integrating proclamation of the word with things like creation care, and certainly in some contexts, not in all, but, but um, addressing issues of uh, public policy, political life, racial reconciliation, social justice and poverty. The majority of world Christians are engaging with theology in much more pluralistic context than we traditionally know in the West and have a lot to teach us um, in pluralistic contexts where we are rapidly becoming the minority, certainly in countries like Australia, if, you know, if not necessarily in, in the United States. And majority of world Christians are also thinking a lot more about the kind of corporate dimensions of Christianity, Christianity as opposed to the individualistic dimensions. I like the way that he challenges us to think about the kind of um, translatability of majority world theological insights, recognizing the key themes, the key trends and habits, and then trying to do the work of translating those into our own context, which can be quite different. If we just take the insights of majority world theology and try to apply them, or majority world practices, and try to apply them in our own context, in some senses that's kind of another form of colonialism or paternalism. Um, it doesn't really honour the uniqueness of the insights and trends in those contexts. We're much more honouring if we list, pay attention to the voice of the Spirit in those contexts and then attempt to translate, to contextualise, to apply those insights in creative um, and Christ-honouring ways in our own context. So I don't have a particular schemata, um, although the work of Timothy Tennant has been quite helpful for me as I began to frame this conversation. Hmm. Dr. Hill, there are a lot of changes afoot in the world today. Technology is certainly creating new streams of communication for people all across the globe. What's your view? Are centripetal or centrifugal forces predominating in global Christianity today? That is to say, is the Christianity represented in Africa, Latin America, Oceania, etc.? Are those Christianities coming closer together or spinning further apart? This is a really good question. I think my, my gut feel is that they're spinning further apart and that we're becoming more isolated, more um, potentially more uh, polarized than in the past. So there are competing forces, as you suggest. So on the one hand, I've been encouraged by the way in which people are listening to voices that are other than their own. Um, you know, so uh, our global, the Global Church Project website, for instance, had about 600 or um, 650,000 visits last year from every country in the world, from persons from every country in the world except for four. And that encourages me because I think there is an interest in listening to global voices. And most of the major theological colleges and seminaries in the United States now are starting programs in world Christianity and global theology. So there is a growing interest in listening to global voices. That's encouraging. But I don't think it's the major, I don't think it's the dominant force. I still think the dominant trend today is towards antagonism, conflict, isolation, uh, fear, and retreat from the other. I think the trend, and there's various ways we can look at this trend sociologically, but the trend is to, is to fear, uh, to criticize, to be suspicious of the other, uh, the theological other, the ethnic other, the sexual other, the racial other, and to not listen to the other and the voice of the other uh, in such a way that we can grow and become unified and develop. So there are competing forces, but I think the trend is away from unity, 
and away from attentiveness and away from honor. And those of us that are committed to world Christianity and to unity need to do everything we can to push back constantly against that trend, I think. Dr. Hill, if we can close this interview with an interview question that I've been asking everyone on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today? How would we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as individual Christians to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? I think it begins with a cultivating a spirit of honor and attentiveness. Honor and attentiveness go hand in hand. So one of the reasons why I started the Global Church Project is because I want Africans to listen to Asians, Asians to listen to Middle Eastern, Eastern thinkers, Middle Eastern theologians and Christians to listen to the voices of Latin America, Latin Americans to listen to Australians, to Australians to listen to Americans, and possibly even uh, those from the United States may begin to listen to Canadians. Uh, that was a bit tongue in cheek. Um, but I'm, I dream of a church where we honor each other, where we pay attention to the voices of other traditions and cultures and theological perspectives. I think unity is cultivated with a humble, generous, attentive, prayerful spirit um, that prefers the other, that listens to the other, that honors the other in every way possible. When we have that kind of spirit, we can know the kind of unity that Jesus suggested was important that expresses a kind of love that the world sees and knows that we are Jesus' disciples. It's been our honor today to be speaking with Dr. Graham Joseph Hill, research coordinator at Sterling Theological College in Melbourne and the author of the text that we've been discussing today, Global Church, Reshaping Our Conversations, Renewing Our Mission, Revitalizing Our Churches. Dr. Hill, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure and it's been wonderful speaking with you.